Welcome to Behind the Schemes, a discussion of how commerce, corruption, and counterfeit cures are destroying our planet's precious wildlife. This is Risha Kota Larsen with Behind the Schemes, and in this episode, we're talking about saving the one horned rhinos of Asia. Two species of rhinos have one horn, and both are found in Asia. The greater one horned rhino is now found only in India and Nepal, and the Javan rhino, sometimes referred to as the lesser one horned rhino, exists in just one population in Indonesia. Dr. Susie Ellis, Executive Director of the International Rhino Foundation, recently shared with us what IRF is doing to protect and increase the populations of these rhinos. The most recent rhino counts in India and Nepal brought some good news about greater one horned rhino populations. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, of course. We're all just absolutely delighted to see the numbers of these, uh, this species just slowly increasing. Um, it's really, it's really been exciting. In the SOM, the numbers have gone up by a little more than 300, according wow. to the counts. Um, so in Kazuranga, the biggest population um, has gone up to almost 2,300 animals, which is phenomenal. They have, they have a terrific growth rate. Um, and in Orang National Park, the numbers appear to have gone up from about 84 in 2009 to about 100 today. Um, that we're a little we're, we're a little worried that some of the some of that increase might be due to the methodologies because that's a an incredibly uh, rapid rate of increase over a very short period of time. But nevertheless, the numbers are up, and so there's great reason to celebrate. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then in Nepal, the numbers are, have, are an unprecedented number at five, about 534 animals. Both countries are doing very well with, these, with this species. That's fantastic. And it, it seems there's a lot of bad news about rhinos these days, but what are India and Nepal doing differently? Well, they're doing a number of things. There's a lot of active management of the species in both places. They have been, uh, both countries have undertaken translocations when they're needed to establish new populations or to reinforce um, populations that might not have the genetic diversity that they need. Um, They also are very, very strict in terms of protection and prosecution of their national laws when they're violated. There are, um, most all the parks in India actually have a shoot-to-kill order within the park after dark, um, which serves as a tremendous deterrent to poachers. They also, um, we were just in um, in India, in the Assam, and visiting Orang National Park in December, and were shown some uh, camera trap photos that were um, taken of poachers who were caught, who were, you know, caught on film in the park in the middle of the night. <laughs> on film. Posted these in all the local communities, and they were actually able to identify these guys and arrest, you know, which led to their arrest and prosecution. So um, they're very, very proactive instead of being reactive. They're very proactive in terms of protection and enforcement. That's great. There's definitely something good going on over there. <laughs> And speaking of uh, India, what is Indian Rhino Vision 2020? Indian Rhino Vision 2020 is a collaborative project. It's a partnership among the government of Assam, WWF India, um, International Rhino Foundation, uh, with support from a number of donors, but in particular the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Mm-hmm. It's a strategy to increase the number of greater one-horned rhinos in India, in Assam, um, to 3,000 by the year 2020, and also have populations, uh, to have at least seven populations within Assam. Right now, there are only four um, viable populations, and one that's just being reestablished in Manas National Park. What what are the parks that don't have any right now that are going to have some as a result of Indian Rhino Vision 2020? 
Well, we've we've reestablished rhinos in Monash National Park. Um, uh, we've moved 18 animals in the past three years, which is a, a good start. We're actually uh, having discussions right now about increasing that number and moving more into Monash so we have a slightly more robust population there. But there's another park called Laukwa that will be the next park to receive animals, and the, the biggest push right now is to get in there and do the habitat assessments to make sure the habitat is going to be adequate mm -hmm. and determine how many animals it can support and also to do security assessments to see what exactly the security needs will be and what security measures we need to put into place before it's safe to move rhinos there. Wow. What so far has been the biggest accomplishment in Indian Rhino Vision 2020? Well, I think it's just been reestablishing this population in Manas National Park, support of the government, and with the support of the local communities, and that includes the Bodo um, Territorial Council. Um, for those of you who might not know about Manas, it was it had a healthy population of rhinos, but it was destroyed in the late 90s and the early 2000s when there was um, rampant civil conflict fighting between the Bodo tribe, which is the local ethnic group, and mm -hmm. the, the central government of India. So, and, and all the rhinos were poached out, the guard posts in the park were destroyed and things. Mm -hmm. there, there, it was just, it, it was a war, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bodo Territorial Council, the Bodo tribe, is one of our greatest allies in bringing the rhinos back. We've hired about 50 local guards, the, the majority of which are, are Bodo people, and so there, there are active partners in terms of securing these, this population and helping it to continue to grow. And I think that's a, that's a really big accomplishment. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that story. Wow. Well, thank you. I can't get it for it. It's, it's all our partners. Everyone works together to, to, to make it happen. What a good outcome there. And what have you found to be the biggest challenge faced by this project? Well, this is going to sound ridiculous, but the biggest challenge we have faced is getting the drugs in, to immobilize the rhinos prior to the translocations. Um, there's a drug called atorphin. It's also known as M99. M99 is used to immobilize the rhinos. And in India, it's all brought into the country in one batch. And so that means it all comes in at the same time and it all expires at the same time. So the government has not allowed the veterinary team to use any expired drugs in these translocations. And sometimes it's quite an ordeal to get the drugs into the country and have that the timing of the arrival of them uh, be, be uh, in sync with when we want to do the translocation. So, that really has been our biggest challenge, and we're, we're overcoming that little by little, but um, every time we get ready to do a translocation, we have to worry about whether or not there are sufficient unexpired drugs within the country. Hmm. Well, those are important for the rhinos to have a safe transport, so I could see where that could, uh, could cause some problems waiting around for it. And then uh, moving on to the other species of one-horned rhino in Asia, the Javan rhino, mm. we recently saw some footage that documented almost every single individual. So can you tell us about the additional camera traps that have been provided by International Rhino Foundation and maybe what kind of footage we can be looking forward to? Absolutely. Actually, the camera traps that recorded the recent footage were donated by the Aspinall Foundation. Okay. UK. They were donated to the Ministry of Forestry. Um, but we have been working with WWF to provide more cameras so that every single area within the park can be camera trapped. The cameras are primarily in the central area of the park. And so what we want to do is make sure that Every area is documented so that if there's any rhinos moving in ways that we might not anticipate it, or if there are a couple of them hanging out in an area where we didn't think they, they would, in an area that we didn't think they would use, that we can document that. And that's also going to help us with identifying different individuals 
we are, we're working actually with WWF to try to develop some software that will be facial recognition software so that we can actually look at the individuals and tell them apart. Right now, there's a lot of guessing. <laughs> Who's who? <laughs> so we're very hopeful that we'll have, we'll have more footage. We'll have footage of every animal. We'll know exactly where they are. And our work with um, our DNA work that we're doing, and we're collecting fecal samples and subjecting it to genetic analysis. Between that, which will give us information in terms of levels of inbreeding, who's related to who, whether they're males and females, backed up by the camera trap data, should give us a pretty robust f picture of what's going on with that population. So we're very excited that all this is coming together at this time. Oh, that is very exciting. And that footage was amazing. I mean, Java and Rhino's meeting each other on the trail and kind of scampering. Java and Rhino scratching themselves. It, that, it was fantastic. It was just one of the most exciting 10 and a half minutes ever. <laughs> it was. And the babies. There were oh, the people. babies. Yeah. That was so rewarding to be able to see them. Oh, yeah. That was that was really great. I love that uh, clip. I've watched it a few times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and can you give us an update on Operation Job and Rhino? Operation Job and Rhino, and, and for people that don't know what that is, we are working in partnership with the National Park and our implementing partner on the ground in Indonesia, uh, Yayasan Badak Indonesia, or the Indonesian Rhino Foundation to try to expand the usable area within Ujang Kula National Park. There's a problem there with an invasive palm species mm. that basically takes over understory, middle story, and canopy, and it blocks light for any kind of rhino food plant. And so what that's doing is it's really restricting what the rhinos have available to eat. So we're, we're doing a lot of habitat management in collaboration with the park to get this invasive plant out and to replant rhino food items and or to let them regenerate on their own. Um, it's, the project has been delayed a little, uh, a little bit because of the need to build better relationships with some of the local communities and get them engaged and involved. Um, we've also been trying to look again at our design for a fence on the eastern side, which was which will be set up to keep domestic cattle out of the park mm -hmm. because there are a lot of a number of diseases that cattle carry that can be transmitted to the rhinos. And so we've redesigned the fence in in um, conjunction with a group that was established by the Ministry of Forestry in order to take a look at that issue again. So it's coming along. Um, it's slow but sure, but um, it's definitely moving forward, and we're delighted with that. Well, that's great to hear. <laughs> and greater one-horn rhinos, which, as we talked about before, are doing really well right now, but they were nearly extinct at one time. Can you compare their situation with what is currently facing the Javan rhinos? Well, I'll try. <laughs> Greater, greater one-horned rhinos were down to uh, fewer than 200 animals at one time. And, and so um, the government of Nepal and the government of India worked very hard to um, set up strict protection and protected areas so that those populations could grow. And as I said earlier, they also undertook a number of translocations among different areas. Mm -hmm. The situation with Java and rhinos is is different in that we're we're down to definitely fewer than fifty animals and probably closer to forty animals right now, and we don't have any place else to put them right now that meets with government approval. Mm. And so one of the next things we will be working with the Ministry of Forestry on is trying to identify a second site, someplace in the species historic range where we can set up another area for them where we can provide adequate protection that has suitable rhino food plants that has community support or if they don't have community support we'll try to build community support to have them in the area. Um, the situation with Java and rhinos is, is far more dire I think than yeah. was faced at, with the greater one horn rhinos and we, I, I think probably the most important thing is that the world needs to communicate 
people who love rhinos need to communicate to the government of Indonesia that, you know, this is a species that's found nowhere else in the world. The population that was in Vietnam went extinct two years ago. Mm -hmm. We really need to encourage and support them to do what's necessary to make some, really some risky decisions in order to save this species. We're worried about it because it's A is in only one location. So if there's a disease outbreak or other kind of problem, it's really, it could be very, very uh, destructive to the species. And then it also sit, the park where they live sits right below where Krakatoa used to be. And there's a new volcano, the son of Krakatoa, they call him, Anak Krakatau, that is erupting all the time. And so it's not beyond the, the it's not beyond um, the scope of what could be that this volcano could also erupt and wipe out the park and, you know, there could be a resulting tsunami or, you know, who knows. So we're just trying to hedge our bets and set up an insurance population for them. Yeah, and when you say risky decisions that should be made by the government, what, can you go into those a little bit? Well, it's, um, a lot of times... It's, it's hard for governments to make bold decisions um, when it comes time to save an endangered species. I mean, let's look at the black-footed ferret, which was down to 18 animals. Let's look at the California condor that was down to very low levels. Um, a lot of times governments tend to wait until it's so dire and it's so far gone that they have to invest millions and millions and millions of dollars in order to recover a species. And by the time a species reaches that point, there's not much room left for research, and there's certainly no room left for error. But it takes a bold it takes a bold government or a bold agency to make those decisions while there's still time. And so we're trying to work with the government of Indonesia to encourage them to make these decisions before we're at the point where there's no room for research and no room for error. Mm-hmm. And we're not too far from that honestly. Yeah, I mean, with close to 40 animals, um, that's, that's a very dire situation, for sure. Yeah, scary. Yeah. So what can people do to get involved and help International Rhino Foundation protect these guys? Well, I think most of all, people, it, we love to share the stories with people. It's not, yes, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but there's also a lot of good news. There's the good news of um, the fact that we've established a new population of greater one-horned rhinos. There's the good news that we're laying the foundation for a second population of Javan rhinos. Um, so I think we want to share with people that there, yes, there's a lot of really bad things going on with rhinos, particularly in light of the poaching crisis in Africa, but there are some glimmers of hope and that we all need to work together to keep those glimmers uh, alive and to turn the burning embers of hope into, you know, a flame. Um, we love to invite people to come to our website, which is rhinos-irf.org. After the 1st of June, it will be just rhinos.org. So we encourage people to visit, um, carry out fundraisers for rhinos, raise money, help us to support our very brave field and dedicated field teams who work under really challenging conditions. The, in Indonesia, for example, our field guys who are doing active rhino protection are out there in the forest for 15 days a month. They are working in really tough areas. Um, they're carrying in all their food, they're carrying in in their bedrolls, they have no communication. Um, if they get sick or hurt, it's really quite a big deal to get medical care. So um, I guess just I, I would encourage people to learn about what we're doing, what's going on with rhinos worldwide, and to share that news with their friends. You know, get the word out. Hmm. For sure. Well, thanks so much, Susie, for spending time with us and also for giving us this good news about these rhinos. We always want good news about them, and it does seem like there's a lack of that. But thanks so much for sharing the good news with us. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad there is good news to share. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) You've been listening to Saving the One-Horned Rhinos of Asia 
with Dr. Susie Ellis, Executive Director of the International Rhino Foundation. This is Risha Kota Larson with Behind the Schemes.